Well, this morning is called to worship. I'll read from Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. That's Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified, do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Amen. All of God's laws are established for our good. God made these laws expressly for our good and our happiness and for our benefit. If we are successful in following his laws, he is always with us. In the end, to be successful in life, we are only to know and follow his laws. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are the most wonderful Father in every way. We pray that we would model ourselves after you. Fill us with your grace, your mercy, and your love that we would display you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Please turn over to number uh, 527. I know whom I have believed. Uh, please stand. Number Five. 527. 28, Bob. 28? Oh, shoot. We'll That's... do 27, too. I don't care. We'll do 29. My faith, my faith has found the resting place then. That's... <laughs> hey, 527 coming before it. <laughs> All right. Number 528. Please stand. <laughs>
seated. Offertory. I will read Matthew 13, verses 44 to 46. That's Matthew 13, verses 44 to 46. The knowledge of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. In these parables, Christ is the most precious pearl and the treasure hidden in the field. Amen. We should discard all of the things of this world for Jesus the Christ and his kingdom. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that we will take this lesson given us by Jesus and hold fast to that truth. In his name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Please stand for the doxology. Praise God from you can stand for the rest of the service if you want. No, I couldn't. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence in this place. Uh, in our lives, in our hearts, and we call upon your name through the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the one who has loved us with an everlasting love, the one who has given his life at Calvary, that we might have life in him and have it more abundantly. Uh, we bless you, Lord, for your presence, and we bless you for the Word of God and how Harold reminded us this morning that it's for our benefit uh, to be a blessing to our lives and to our souls. Uh, but we thank you for the, the living Word, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we thank you for taking up residence in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that we would be touched today by your Spirit, uh, by your good grace, Lord, that we would know that we've been with you. Uh, we thank you for the reminder to be strong and courageous. Um, we thank you that you have not given us a spirit of fear or of timidity, but one of power, uh, one of grace, uh, the Holy Spirit of grace who lives in our life and in our heart. Uh, also, Father, too, <clears throat> we pray that as we uh, open up your word today, uh, that the Holy Spirit would uh, guide us and give us understanding and blessing and insight into your word as only he can do. Uh, we humble our hearts this morning, Lord, and we come like little children uh, that we might, be receive, and might receive, uh, that we would have eyes and hearts uh, like little children, and then we would be uh, innocent and in many things, Lord, uh, that we would just be like a sponge and suck up everything uh, that we hear um, today that would be deep to the glory of Christ, uh, everything that would be sung, uh, said, uh, spoken of, 
uh, to the glory of Christ. Father, also uh, thank you uh, that we can lift up those in our congregation uh, that uh, that we can't see, uh, we can't physically touch, uh, but I think of Sandy Sherman, I think of Gil Briggs, I think of Edith Perfetti, I think of Fred Legler, I think of Maria Johnson, uh, the many Lord that um, are physically infirmed, uh, that have been shut in uh, because of the virus or for other reasons, but we lift them up before you, encourage their hearts, and uh, fill them with great, great joy and peace. Uh, also, uh, Father, too, thank you for Annie's testimony this morning. Uh, we rejoice that you have brought her to that place uh, to get rid of smoking and the cigarettes. And uh, we pray that you would strengthen her each and every day in that decision. And when the temptations come and the trials come, uh, that you would strengthen her even more, that she would be ever mindful uh, that you are by her side, uh, that you give her the victory through her Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we also thank you for Marie's testimony too, Lord, and how you uh, change us uh, through the years and how you make us a different people. Uh, to the glory of Christ and we're uh, so so excited about that uh, father too I want to lift up Colin that you would bring healing to his injuries uh, and especially that you uh, would remind him uh, of your protection and how uh, it could have been far worse uh, we thank you uh, for somebody finding him uh, where he didn't lay there for even uh, hours or days, uh, but we pray that you would work in Colin's life and heart, uh, that he would look up and he would worship you, give you praise. Uh, Lord, for again for our country, uh, the disunity, uh, the chaos, the violence, uh, we pray that you would bring healing. Uh, we pray that your Holy Spirit would descend uh, and sweep across this land, uh, that you would um, forgive our sin, and bring healing to our land, Lord, that we would repent uh, of our, our sin and our shortcomings, uh, that we would seek your face. Now, we especially pray that this would be true for our leaders. Uh, Father, um, um, you know where their hearts are at. You know that they take pride in what they do. And you bring uh, what we exalt, you bring low. And uh, uh, we pray that uh, our leaders would find some humility, that they would seek your face, that they would seek to work together. Uh, we also pray against the forces that seek to divide, uh, to seek um, to divide uh, economically, racially, socially, financially, um, whether it be through different ethnicity, um, education, all the forces that would seek to divide. Uh, we come against it and we ask in the name of Jesus that you uh, would turn it back. Uh, we, we lift up our country. Uh, we love our country, Lord. And we, um, we, we pray that you would rescue it uh, during this time. Uh, but we also pray that your will be done. Uh, we honor and respect that, and we pray that your will would be done. Uh, bless our hearts as we continue to worship. We want to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, Bill is... Uh, welcome, Bill, to uh, Scripture reading. Uh, bless you for doing this. Thank you. everyone. Our first reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. 
and that's on page 1148 in the Red Pew Bibles. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we, don't, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons and daughters of the light, and sons and daughters of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. This morning, the second scripture reading from the Old Testament, from the prophet Habakkuk, the second chapter, the first three verses, and for using a church Bible, that can be found on page 9 and 10. Again, the second chapter of Habakkuk, verses 1 through 3, on page 9 and 10. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. The Lord's answer. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so the herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. May the Lord add his blessing. Let's commit this time to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I, I pray that you would quicken our hearts through the Holy Spirit and what I say today would be words from your heart, uh, your spirit, uh, to our hearts and to our souls. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So folks, uh, last week I talked to you about the Lord being faithful <clears throat> and this is who he is and he's the faithful shepherd of our, of our souls and that truth should be, be a great comfort to each and every one of us uh, as we reflect on that. Now this week uh, I've been led to talk about our responsibility when it comes to keeping watch. So God watches over our souls as the great shepherd of the sheep but, but the question is what is our responsibility? <clears throat> now, if you go throughout the scriptures, there are numerous uh, exhortations about being spiritually watchful, being vigilant, being sober or alert, standing or staying on guard. 
Uh, we see one of these passages in Habakkuk, the scripture that Dave read for us this morning. Habakkuk is the watchman on the wall. He's kind of got like the guard position, so to speak. And, you know, he's presented as ready to hear a word from God. Waiting, listening, watching, anticipating. We're to all be like Habakkuk, right? We also see vigilance promoted in the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew chapter 25. You know the parable, but there were ten virgins, right? And five did not have enough oil in their lamps. And we're, we're exhorted not to be of the five that don't have enough oil, that are wandering and scrambling and running around looking for oil at the last minute, right? Spiritual vigilance. Uh, we read in 1 Peter 5, it exhorts us to be sober and alert because the devil, Peter says, is roaming to and fro in the earth, seeking whom he may devour. Yes, the, the devil was alive and well. And so we're told to be sober so we do not become his prey. Also, uh, you'll recall that Jesus spoke on uh, guarding and keeping watch. Uh, regarding the signs of his times, right, his coming, or to be on watch, on guard for various vices that can actually ruin the soul. Covetousness, greed, riches, lust, the like. Uh, Solomon even wrote in the Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 23, this is another verse that I learned early on uh, as a script, uh, as a young Christian, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. I think it's fair to say that when Solomon wrote that, he wrote it with great understanding and probably great regret, because there was for a time where he didn't watch over his heart with all diligence. So I asked uh, this morning. I ask you what. What does keeping watch, spiritual vigilance, alertness, guarding the heart supposed to look like in our day and age? What's, what's it supposed to look like? Well, it, it's probably no different in spiritual principle than what it was supposed to look like a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. But I, I ask this question uh, in the context of our political culture and, you know, climate today in our country. What is, what is spiritual vigilance, keeping watch, alertness, and guarding the heart supposed to look like with the craziness that's going on around us? How do we negotiate that? What are we, um, as believers, to be doing? What are we to look for? I think they're very, very relevant questions. How do we sort through the spiritual fog of war. Now, you've probably heard that term, the fog of war. Dave, you were in the military. Bob, you were in the military. Harold, you were in the military. Carl, you were in the military. Jerry, uh, I mean, go on and on, right? Um, and so what is the fog of war? Uh, it's an expression of sorting through what happened or what is happening, right? And it's typically a military term and it's kind of like a post-exit interview, like after a firefight, like, soldier, what, what took place? It's kind of like a, you know, a, a journaling after the fact, right? And soldiers are asked to piece together the details. And you know, uh, a lot of times one guy will say, well, I don't remember this. And the guy says, oh yeah, that definitely happened. Another one will say, yeah, well, this is how I remember. And so you have varying accounts and different perspectives and opinions, right? For believers, how do we sort, sort through the fog, the fog of war? It is an ongoing spiritual assessment and analytically processing all the stuff around us. That's what it means. It means sensing the spiritual mood of the season. That's what it means. Keeping watch making spiritual assessment is never more appropriate 
than now. Amen? You gotta, you gotta keep the you know the head on the swivel. You can't lose it. But you have to sort through it. Because it's thick. The fog is thick. So what I want to do is I quickly, I want to create a spiritual paradigm of what it means to keep watch, spiritual vigilance, alertness, guarding the heart. I think it's very, very simple. It's, it's having ears to hear. You know, uh, you read the, the messages to the churches in Revelation, he who has ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, right? We, we often fail to listen or to rely on the Holy Spirit. A lot of times what we do is, you know, we, we just kind of distill everything from a human wisdom point of view. And we, you know, we make decisions based on pros and cons. But what is God saying? You know, we say, we, we teach people not to trust your feelings. And yet you have to be a person who feels. And we teach people to trust the word of God, amen? Because that sure doesn't move. It's like more than the rock of Gibraltar. It's forever. It's eternal. But we don't teach people to rely on the Holy Spirit often, do we? What is the Holy Spirit of God saying? I love it when you, you know, you ever read like the scripture account where the Spirit, you know, it, it, scripture says, that, and the Spirit guided him, or the Spirit guided her. Or by the Holy Spirit, they said this. That's so precious, and we miss that, don't we? It's not only having, the paradigm is not only having ears to hear, it's having hearts to perceive. What is of God, and what is not of God? That's very important. It's a divine calibration of sorts. It's a spiritual perception and insight. I had somebody say something to me the other day. I was like, that's not of God. I knew it right away. Do you ever have somebody say something to you? And it's almost like, oh my goodness, that was like the devil speaking. And, and you know, we see, that, we see that account with Peter and Jesus, right? Huh. Pastor I interned under said, wait till the devil speaks out of your wife's mouth. Never happened though, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. It's, it's ears to hear, hearts to perceive, eyes to see. And it's actually going beyond the physical, right? It's looking kind of like behind the veil. Trying to sort it all out. What is God saying? Ears to hear, hearts to perceive, eyes to see. You know Isaiah said that in Isaiah chapter 6. He said that to the people. But guess what? They were always hearing, they were always seeing, but they really weren't perceiving. It was actually an, a spiritual indictment of judgment. He said that to them in the context of judgment. Uh, they weren't plugged in, in other words, to what the Spirit of God was actually doing or saying or wanted them to know. It's interesting, Jesus often spoke in parables too. Uh, that was a spiritual indictment. People would walk away and say, what did he say? Huh? It's because of where they were at spiritually that it was a spiritual indictment. They should have been spiritually ready. They should have been hearing and perceiving and watching and seeing. And they weren't. I think keeping watch is about what God is doing in our day as well. It's, it, again, listening and looking, waiting, watch, like, like Habakkuk on the wall. You know, many people aren't doing that. Many, many people don't want to take a position on the wall. It's not like me at Nehemiah's day. Remember in Nehemiah's day, you know, he went back to um, build, rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And it was during terrible times. And he had to position people on the wall with a sword and a trowel. People don't want to take positions on the wall today. They want to, they want to remain aloof. I, we were going up to vote yesterday. I said to my wife, you know, sometimes you just want to go away. Sometimes you don't want the position on the wall, right? 
God is asking the church to take a position on the wall. Being spiritually ready. Assessing the signs of the times and how it's moving closer to the end. But, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, you read Matthew chapter 25 or 24, uh, not chapter 24, and, you know, what did Jesus say about the signs of his coming? You know, there will be wars and there will be rumors. It's more than that. There will be famines and there will be earthquakes. It's more than that. It's trends in politics. You watch, you watch the, some of the signs of the times, people totally miss. It's, it's trends in politics, trends in culture, trends in business, trends in finances. Harold gave me a great, great article last year. It, it came out of the Midnight Call, which is a organization. Um, you can find it online. But assesses trends prophetically. And you know that there are transnational and transglobal companies, companies that are that are coming together with massive amounts of money and political clout and forming, forming uh, alliances in such a way where eventually if you don't line up with their ideals you can't, you're not going to buy their product it's going to be a whole global conglomerate very interesting article another little piece of the puzzle that God you know, gave in my mind and heart to fit with revelation and what's coming. But it's, it's identifying an antichrist spirit in those things and in those trends. That's what it is. It, it's identifying radical um, trends that are a radical departure from Christ and his word. Paul referred to this in the uh, in Second Thessalonians passage. Uh, you know, that uh, there's going to be a great apostasy. Now people want to talk about whether it's with Israel, with the church. It, it's a falling away. It's a great falling away from God and His Word. That's what it is. And I understand it to be that Christ is not at the center. The Word of God is just thrown out. Doesn't that perfectly fit with our time? You tell me that it doesn't. People flying the rainbow flag, churches flying the rainbow flag. Look, you know, um, I have nothing against gay people, but being gay, it, it's sinful. It's a sinful lifestyle. It's no different than committing adultery, and it's no different than being a thief, and it's no different than being an idolater or, you know, any other thing that departs from the Word of God. It's sin. It's what it is. And yet we have politicians that come out and affirm it. Christ wouldn't affirm that. Would he? I don't think so. But you see, you know, it's not popular. It's not politically correct. It's not kind. In fact, it's even called hate speech, isn't it? Take a look, folks, at what's happening. There's this great falling away. God doesn't come until that happens. Uh, Antichrist comes before that happens. I see it as a great falling away from Christian values and norms, Christian civilization and culture. Now, I can't help but think of what Daniel says in Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 of how Antichrist will intend to make alterations in times and in, in the times and in law. And you know what I interpret that to mean? Calendars and dates and uh, actual changing of the walls uh, that are of a totally different nature than what we're used to. And I see it happening in our country. Our great constitution being shredded. You can't even say anything without everybody wolf packing on you. What, what happened to the First Amendment? You can't even talk about Christ and his values because you're a bigot. Church needs people like Habakkuk to stand on the wall. 
Keeping watch, due diligence, spiritual alertness means praying. I think you know that. It means being in the Word. I think you know that. It means being busy at God's work. I think you know that. But it's also sorting through the mixed messages and the various voices in our culture. It's, it's deafening. It's watching, as I said the other week, what people do. It's also carefully listening to what they say or what they don't say, right? You know, somebody, when, when people are quiet, sometimes that's more powerful of a statement than what they actually would say. It means assessing what people teach and preach. Because I know that you can walk out of here today and you can turn on a radio or get a TV program or get something on your phone and you can hear the Word of God. Or you can hear somebody at least expound on the Word of God. Be careful also of who you listen to with pre teaching and preaching. And I've said this from day one since I came into this pulpit. Like the Bereans, be noble, search the scriptures, see if what I teach and say is true. Because I'm no different. You have to sort it through. But you know, think about it. It's, it's a tall order, isn't it? How do you sort through all this? Uh, we're living in a time of emotional and spiritual overload. Politically, it uh, breaks my heart to see what's happening to our country. I think it breaks your heart too. Uh, newsflash. Donald Trump is not responsible for all the chaos. Is he? I don't think so. All the chaos seems to be left in left-leaning states and cities. The blue states, the democratic states, the states that they've had a lock on for 50, 60, 70 years. Government programs, policies, this is not your mom and dad's Democratic Party, folks. This is totalitarianism. It's not your Republican Party either. I'm not a Republican nor a Democrat. I just call it balls and strikes, black and white. It's a Marxist, godless spirit of statism that's on the rise. That's what it is. Read Revelation. That's what Antichrist does. That's an antichrist spirit. What you see in the Democratic Party today is an antichrist spirit. And you also see it largely in some Republican circles too because they don't speak out. It's true. I wouldn't give you two cents for some Republicans. This is far different than what our country was founded on, amen? It was founded on Judeo-Christian values, small government, self-reliance, governance to the states, not a big federal government, not handouts. The Bible says if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. But no, you know, just give out the welfare, write the checks all day long. How does that work? We, we are so overloaded emotionally and politically and financially and culturally. Sin's running rampant. You can't call sin, sin. Right? Try it. Try it sometime. See if God doesn't give you the chutzpah or the grace to try to do that sometime. Freedom of speech and religion is under attack. Good is evil. Evil's good, as I said the other week. Did you, if you read the prophets, it's the same thing. And what happened to Israel? Jeremiah wept. Weeping prophet because God, it was all up, uprooted. God, God let it get uprooted. Good, evil, evil, good. You talk about twisted thinking. That's a problem, isn't it? The other day, a Black Lives Matter voice and leader in the movement, you may have known this, called for the destruction of all statues and symbols of Jesus in the culture 
because it speaks of white supremacy. Now, I decided to read a bio on this guy. Do you know he was a former pastor? Hello? A former pastor, right? I am quite certain that Jesus' statues do not stand for white supremacy. I know that Jesus wasn't white, and I know that he wasn't black. I know he was Jewish. I don't care what color he was. And that may be an argument for not making statues and pictures, because I think the first commandment says don't even do that. But aside from that, aside from that, I think they stand for Christ and Christian values and virtues. I think that's why they were put there in the first place. Amen?